Well, Lou, welcome to the Book Thinkers Life Changing Books podcast. How are you doing today, man? Nicholas, totally excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And this is a, uh, a home and home. This is a returning favorite because I had you in my program very recently. So very cool. It is super cool conversation. You are an excellent podcast host. So let's see if I can live up to the hype. Now, for those that are not familiar with you or your upcoming book or your podcast, I'd love to have you introduce yourself to the Book Thinkers family and tell us all a little bit about yourself. Sure. My name is Lou Diamond, and I am a sales and marketing consultant, and I speak and I write about connecting. I love telling people, Nick, that I was put on this planet to work with the most amazing businesses, leaders, and brands and help them thrive through the power of connecting. And I've learned that a lot of the work that I do, whether it's to speak on a podcast or speak on a stage or work with some really impressive clients and help them grow their business so they can thrive, is that I'm helping them have better conversations. Uh, the At the epicenter of every single connection is a great conversation between two people. And I realized if we can do that job better, man, a lot of things get done faster, quicker, and enable us to connect in ways that we never thought. So that's where I focus and that's the, the space I plan. Now, tell us a little bit about your podcast. You just mentioned that I was on it recently. So tell mm -hmm. us how many episodes have you had? How many interviews have you conducted? <laughs> It keeps going. Uh, the Thrive Loud with Lou Diamond podcast is about those that are thriving in their lives, their businesses, and their passions. Uh, today, I think I recorded the 799th episode or wow. 800th episode. I'm not actually sure. Uh, where we we do about three, we we have three episodes every week: Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, and you can find it wherever your podcasts are shown. Uh, it has been. It's almost like an animal that I just can't control. I thought I had it in a cage, but it's now grown to like the size of the house and it just keeps taking everything over uh, because I'm, I'm, I've am I'm done podcasts at speaking events that I deal with. Many of the clients that I have have come through the podcast. It's been a business generator. It's been an incredible platform to connect with great people and the conversations that I've been able to have, like even the one that I have with you, Nicholas, which was to learn about such incredible people that are thriving in so many different ways has like, just as books have helped make your world and your life so much better, uh, listening to these incredible people and connecting with them on the podcast has done the same for me. I like that you said the podcast has enabled you to create real business relationships. And I think it's done the same thing for me because you hear that saying, you don't marry somebody on the first date. You want to go on a couple of dates with them, get to know them before you do business with them yeah. or marry them. And I think the podcast is a great way to form a relationship with somebody. And I think you've done that now 800 times. That's amazing. And so I look it's forward e to- It's uh, even more than that. Can I give you a little behind the scenes? You see, Thrive yes. Loud is just one podcast that I have. But because of its success and some of those business opportunities that I've had, I've actually created other programs that no one really gets to hear because they're inside the walls of really large companies. Some of uh, three or four of the top 500 companies in the Fortune 500, there are podcast programs that I've either produced or hosted inside the walls of big companies that came from the Thrive Loud podcast initially. So it's probably closer to like 1,500 episodes or something like that, which is berserk. But it's it's crazy and it's become uh, an integral part of uh, and obviously a revenue source for my business. So yeah, there's been a lot. You are a master at connection and communication and conversation, which rolls right into this book that's coming out September 27th. Is that correct? That is the launch date. Okay, yes. so speak easy. Tell us all about the book. When did you come up with the idea for writing it? Why did you write it? Who's the target reader? Let's go into all of it at once. So my first book I wrote, a little over six and a half, seven years ago, it was called Master of the Art of Connecting. And it, it kind of danced at the top of what Speakeasy actually dove into. And that was that I knew that I was a very good connector and I knew how to connect with other individuals. And I saw a way for people to think differently on how they can connect. It wasn't just about making a sale or uh, being a great marketer with a good message, or even being a leader and connecting with your your people in a certain way to lead. It kind of tapped into uh, what I call the connecting core muscles. These are the, the muscles inside of us that we all have, which I call the safe. I could break them down, but that's what I did in Master of the Art of Connecting. Each letter had a specific muscle on how we can work on being a better connector. I made two promises after that first book, which you'll laugh about, uh, Nicholas. When one, uh, that... If I 
I was never going to write another book mm-hmm. unless I had something really important to say. And the second part was that I would partner with a publishing company that was really professional and was very focused on the, knew exactly how I can connect to my audience. And that was an important marriage that I wanted to make if I ever got to that point. But the truth was for five plus years, I didn't have anything to write about. And something kind of started, the bug started getting inside of me uh, right around, I I, want to say it was around the beginning of the pandemic, but it it was probably a little before it. And I had this idea some, it was actually a guest on the podcast show who made a comment to me that my ability to listen and spin what I hear and use it in a way to connect with another person was something unique and it was a skill. And I had actually originally thought I was going to write about listening. I did research on this, Nicholas. I went down the whole avenue about listening. I even went to a firm in northern in the Northwest part of the United States that specializes in um, in auditory hearing aids to understand what they're trying to tap in with listening. And I really wanted to understand really the the nuts and bolts of listening. And there were some lessons that I learned from it. And, and a couple of them were that uh, one, I wasn't the right person to communicate this message. There was somebody else that probably was a little bit more studied and, and really had the expertise in that. And two, listening was only half of what I did well. Uh, I understood that when you think about a conversation, which is what I do really well, it's about asking great questions and then listening to those responses and then coming back with a a response that connects that message that you heard. That's what happens in a conversation. And you keep building on it like a layer of a house. And I realized um, in the art of of a conversation, it was it like dawned on me that someone who's been focusing on connecting, and I really had been working with my clients to help them have better conversations, even in the sales communication that they send out, their presentations, the way they message themselves, the way their marketing should think. And even more importantly, the leaders I work with, what they should be saying and communicating to their people in their organization. And this is what I've been doing. What I didn't realize was that I was getting really, really good at it from being on this side of the microphone. And I started picking up other things that I realized that I was starting to take from being behind the microphone and deploying into the way I prepared for a speech when I would give it, the way I would work with my clients, the way I'd help leaders become better leaders. I'd be making them have better conversations. And it came to me one day from a friend who gave me a very helpful title that one of the other things I love to do um, is to go out and I love to mix a couple of drinks here or there. And I said, wouldn't it be great if I mixed all of these things together and kind of made that the theme for how we can have better conversations? I just didn't have a name. I'm going to give my shout out to a best-selling author and amazing, very good friend, Billy Howard, who uh, runs a company called Brandthrow. And she is a genius when it comes to coming up with names. And literally in the middle of the night, sent me a message. I go, got it. Check your email. And there it was. Speak easy. Connect with every conversation. And that was it. So actually, in a weird way, the title came before the book, um, which is so crazy. Uh, and and everything then just came pouring out. The book, the title, the, the all the content. It was like literally if we went into the bar and all, we just took all the drinks and started pouring them into one big concoction. And uh, it came out with a real simple flow for how you can have better conversations. Well, as we talked about pre-roll, I really enjoyed it. And as somebody who hosts a lot of conversations and is always networking and meeting new people, and I'm somebody who's just infinitely curious. So I love the different forms of conversation, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, I found a lot of value in the book. Now, let's go back and do a little bit of history, though, because my primary audience is 18 to maybe early 30s, might not understand the whole prohibition speakeasy metaphor. (laughs) So could you describe that to everybody? Yeah. So if you didn't know this, um, speakeasies, which you might know if you're a young listener as a place that you can go in and hear some good jazz jazz music or bars, and a lot of them are in cities, um, in a city near you. Uh, But back in the Prohibition era, you were not allowed to have these type of places that probably served bathtub gins and other types of concoctions and did some probably late night activities that were probably not very legal at that time. So the name Speakeasy actually came because everybody and the bartenders encouraged people in 
these venues to speak easy and be quiet because you didn't want to let the cops know where you were. These were usually hidden places. There were secret knocks on the door. Sometimes they were back doors to regular uh, retail establishments like bakeries or clothing stores or whatever. And behind them were these cool nightclubs that everybody uh, kind of had a lot of fun with. And, and for the record, I'm pretty sure the cops knew about it. It was just a matter of, you know, making sure you were quiet and not upsetting the neighbors. So speak easy became the, the term uh, as it related to what I wanted to do, it actually was also really relevant to myself because as you've learned, and maybe your listeners can hear right now, first of all, I have an easy sounding voice and everyone, I'm an easy personality as well. Uh, it's something that has always been a very likable trait of mine. And I'm not, I, I could get really loud and, you know, be really quiet, but it's this easy, comfortable feeling that when I have a conversation with someone, my voice is actually trying to connect with them, which is kind of a play we'll talk about, I'm sure on this, on this podcast. And uh, so speak easy was perfect, but it also was really important because it, it brought together something that I've learned and that it, it, this is something that is easy to do and it is coachable. So the lessons that this book provides is a very helpful way to connect your conversations and to make more of the conversations you have connect so you can have more of them and grow the connections in your life. I don't think we talked about it much on our episode for your show, Thrive Loud. But when I was younger, not only was I not a reader, but I also had very poor communication skills. I mean, mm -hmm. I had diagnosed anxiety. I could, I, I would leave the classroom if I had to read a paragraph in front of everybody. I would stay home sick from school and present to the teacher after school. I mean, I had a lot of social anxiety. And so books like this can really help somebody understand there is an art to conversation. It's not just this gray area. Some people are good. Some people are bad. Some people are born salespeople. Some people aren't. It's not true. It's something that you can learn. It's something that there are strategies for, which we could talk about in a couple of minutes. And so I'm really happy that you wrote the book. I mean, I, I really could have used it a few years ago. <laughs> well, so it's funny, Nicholas, because uh, I give a spe I speak to college students uh, twice a year up at a university in New York. And I actually do a lecture for different classes. And these are communication classes. And a lot of it is how you need to be within the workplace and a lot of the ways and how you could work on communicating. So there are actual things that were written in Speakeasy that came from a bunch of those lectures in helping students know how they can have better conversations with their bosses or address certain uncomfortable situations. And what I wanted to make it about was there, look, you cannot map out the perfect conversation. You, you can't plan it and, you know, get from the beginning A to Z and on a straight line. There's so many different ways that every conversation can go. But what you can control is how you need to be going into it, maybe a little bit of preparedness stuff about yourself or certain things you can practice. And through more conversations, you could become adept at it. So the the book is a guidebook. It is it's a tool book that you can go back to for for over and over again. Even though it does read read like a book, uh, and there are lessons and stories and a lot of the examples. While each chapter concludes with ways that relate to business, uh, students and for your personal life, or you know whether for your friends or or your intimate lovers or whatnot, that you can use a lot of the tools from Speakeasy for all of your conversations to gain a lot of the confidence that you said you were lacking when you were younger, that maybe people are a little hesitant on, on how you could think about what that conversation is about. It's a new sense of appreciation of it that will change you from being nervous about having one to being excited about having more of them. Absolutely. No, I mean, that that's the energy that I felt when I was reading the book. And you made an interesting point in the intro. So we'll kind of jump into some of the content from yeah. the book that most meaningful relationships that you have, you, me, and every listener today, right now, they started with a conversation. Mm -hmm. And so those connections, if you can apply what you learned from this book to improve the likelihood of success, you can have more meaningful relationships. You can do more business. You can have more fun. You can bring more exciting people into your life. Like whatever your goal is, it all starts with a conversation. And so when I was reading that in the book, I thought, I mean, geez, my now fiance that started as a conversation, every single business venture that I've participated in, they started with conversations. You and me started yeah. as a conversation. So it's a really cool point that you make there. And I think uh, one of the overarching themes of the book, which has a lot to do with the way you need to be, is that, look, we were disconnected 
uh, during that whole window of time, those last two and a half years of, of COVID, even though we were able to have conversations on the phone or via Zoom like you and I are doing right now. Uh, but we lost a lot of that in-person connection. And what we took for granted was the ability to just have a conversation with anyone. And, and that realization hit me that you have to treat the opportunity to speak to anyone, any individual. Heck, it could be the 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 guy who's checking your bags out at the grocery store to uh, to a cab driver to to somebody that you just interact with, you know, in passing. You have to treat every conversation as a gift because it is. Uh, this is a very disconnected world. We're all really busy, and the opportunity to speak to another means something different than just talking to someone. What it actually means is that if you do a conversation right. You have a chance to bring your world into another person's world and another person's world into yours, which means that you're going to learn and grow from just one conversation. And that connection can begin a relationship that will add to more conversations that will help grow into a really profitable business, profitable friendship, or a valuable life. So conversations are gifts, and we don't want to let those gifts pass by. We love gifts. Let's take them in and have more of them if we can. Yeah, we love gifts and we always want to be present with them. And yeah. I, I think every time I meet a new person and not that I'm I'm always looking to get something from the relationship in terms of a value exchange, but you are always three feet from gold, as they say, you never know what somebody can do for you. And I, that, that just brings me back to a quick story. I want to highlight real quick. When I was first starting Book Thinkers, and it was mainly just a social media community, Sometimes that's tough when you're posting and you're not getting a lot of engagement and you never really know who's in your audience. But that point that every single connection, every like, every comment, it's a gift. And you yeah. never know. You're always three feet from gold. Somebody might come out of the woodwork one day and change your entire life. So there are a lot of creators out there. Don't give up. Don't stop posting your podcasts. Don't stop posting on social media. You never know what's going to happen. So uh, it, It's so true. And, and, and I, I have a special place in my heart for other podcasters. And, and I think you've probably connected on this conversation as well. You've been on other podcast shows. You've had other podcasters on your program. We're providing great content for the world to listen to. We're basically enabling conversations to be other people to tap in and, and listen to them just as your listeners are doing right now. That's a gift in itself because we learn from those other conversations and we've been doing it for years. Uh, I mentioned it a lot in the book with you know, from Larry King to Oprah Winfrey to Howard Stern. These are people who have been providing incredible interviews and conversations that we love. And all every night before we go to sleep, late night TV, there is a conversation between two people that literally is the last thing we hear before we go to bed and we get excited about it. There is something engaging. It lifts us up. There is a connect. The connection itself that takes place during a conversation is energy that can literally lift up and not only change the people having the conversation, but those observing it as well. And that's important. That means we need more of them and it'll help bring us together that much faster and that much more often. Well, you bring up uh, another point that I wanted to talk about today, which is that in the book, you highlight a 2010 survey that found yeah. that the average person participates in 25 conversations a day. And when I first read that, I thought to myself, well, I know a lot of people who definitely don't have 25 in-person conversations a day, but you define conversation a little bit differently. You just highlighted a way that you can participate in a conversation, which is watching a late night TV interview. So what yeah. are some of the other ways that people can communicate and participate in conversations? Well, what we, we've highlighted podcasts, which is probably the number one medium. And I think, uh, I mean, the growth of podcasts alone is, is just scary, right? I, whatever it is. It, now we're over 2.2 million podcast programs out there with over 60 million episodes that are active. Uh, which is crazy. That's that's a lot of content, people. And just about every single one of those is a conversation. I know a lot of them are one person talking, but you could argue that person's talking to you and you're listening and learning from them. Um, going to hear speakers speak at events. Um, I'm a professional speaker. You go to a conference, say what you want. That might just be one person talking, but a lot of times the really good ones interact with the audience, but they're engaging in content that you could be utilizing as a conversation. The important thing to think about as it relates to conversations is they're everywhere and we have them at work multiple times a day. And I hate one particular form of conversation. Someone said I should write a second book on this, like a third book, whatever. I'm, I'm staying away from that. But our email communication that we have, it is a conversation. It's just kind of one way at the time. But it's important that we recognize we use this constantly. We use text constantly. These are conversations that we're having constantly, um, DMs throughout the day. 
my goodness, start adding it up. And by the way, it's way more today. It's way more than that. 25. I think we're missing out. We're a little um, unequally balanced on having stuff that's electronic communications versus the stuff we're doing, which is live and voice to voice and in person. Uh, which I, I encourage most people when you have the opportunity, an important thing to do to improve the connection or relationship. And this is a great work thing. Don't go back and forth with emails and texts 600,000 times. Pick up the phone. <laughs> Just have, believe it or not, I learned that there's a button on, on my iPhone. It's got a green background with a white thing on it. And it, if you press it, you could actually speak to another human being. I, would you believe they've had this on here for that long? It enables you to have a conversation, which is important. Try to get to having more of those conversations. We recognize not everything needs to be voice-to-voice, face-to-face, but add them all up. These are where we're making our connections in our day. I I am with you. I second that point. I think it's very important to have face-to-face or voice-to-voice conversations. And one of one of the ways that I was able to develop my ability to communicate was by reading books, which I view as a form of communication. Yeah. I always say, listen, it, it's tough to get Elon Musk to mentor you for 20 bucks. But if you go read his biography written by Ashley Vance, you can be mentored in some way, shape, or form by Ashley and by Elon. And that's a really cool relationship. And I have hundreds of relationships with the people behind me, hundreds of them. Steve Martin's first uh, fiction book was it made into a movie called Shop Girl. And a friend of mine recommended it to me and it wasn't necessarily the, all the topics that I would be interested in, but I happen to love Steve Martin. And I read that book and I heard Steve Martin talking to me when I was reading it. And I remembered eventually I got the audio book and it made it even better. Uh, which is a great way to think about it. This is a conversation that you can have. You are listening to a reader who is trying to communicate with you. Uh, there are sometimes you want to shout back at the book, but you know that that might not necessarily create the true connection you want. But yes, you can connect through those books and have conversations that way too. Yeah, you can. I, I love viewing these books, especially a book like yours as a tool in a tool belt. I call it my book belt. So when I see a hammer or when I see a nail, I can pull out the hammer and I can use it. When I see an opportunity to improve my communication, I can go pull out speak easy and use it. So these books are tools, they're opportunities for conversation. Uh, let's dive into some of the more applicable things. So at the end of every chapter, you have these connect, engage and win sections with action items. So why did you decide to do that? So when I, as someone, as I mentioned, who is a sales and marketing consultant and professional, this is where I'm, that's the, that's the area that I've spent my, my entire career in, in helping people do their, those jobs better. And a top sales performer, a really creative marketer and mixing all that together to help people take advantage of that. I knew that the lessons that I had in Speakeasy could be applied on their own without a business setting, just as we were talking about in personal situations. However, I did not want to take away from one of the best advantages that conversations in business can have, and that is that you can win more sales. You can make your marketing message connect, and as a leader, you can establish the connections you need with your company and the people that work with you if you take a lot of the lessons from Speakeasy and deploy them in your place of business. So I wanted to make sure that at every end of every chapter, there is a connect, engage, and win win section that is dedicated specifically to the tips on how to apply the lessons learned in that particular chapter of Speakeasy, specifically so how you can win the business, make the connections and engage and continue the relationships that help to grow in your business sense. So it was intentional to isolate it in those connect, engage and win tips as a great way to put it into practice, the lessons learned from that chapter. Sometimes I have authors ask me, hey, is there anything that you would recommend I include in my book when I write it or my next book when I write it? Is there anything you wish I did differently? And the only feedback that I really ever have for people that's consistent is you need to make it more actionable. You need to you need to make it easy for somebody to identify like you did. You isolated the action items. You need to make it easy for a reader to identify what can be easily implemented or not easily, but implemented so that they can create real behavior change. And not only does it improve their lives, but it it sort of lengthens their relationship with your book. And yeah. it increases the ability for them to tell other people about it because it creates real change. As as a speaker and I and I host and conduct a lot of workshops in helping companies grow their business, it also is laid out every chapter in the way that I do that. There's a story in the beginning of every chapter that's either personal personal or I've something I've known about. And I place that story as the example to set the, the, the stage. 
I then dive into the meat and potatoes as to the problem that we're dealing with at that part of a conversation or the the way you need to be on, in a conversation. And then the lessons that you could take at the end, the takeaways is the connect, engage, and win. And that was intentional from the very beginning. Weaving that all together was was not easy, but that was the the flow for, that I wanted the the book to achieve. And uh, an example of this, so after chapter one, you talked about how business meetings are normally like top down. They're, they're a presentation style. You just speak at a group of people the entire time. What you're recommending is that you need to make it more of a conversation. And so you give the reader some additional tips and tricks and stuff like that. But yeah. uh, that's a that's a good example. Yeah, that's that's a fun one. I mean, and, and a lot of times uh, people go into sales meetings specifically I've seen the, this is the the worst of sales when they go in and they're with a scripted response and they're only talking about themselves or they're only showing what I love to call the the logo slide of death, which basically like has every single company you've ever worked with um, and says, here's all the great people that I've worked with. Well, if you're on the receiving end of this, <laughs> you're basically saying there's everybody that isn't me. Yes. And, and you're, you're setting <laughs> the wrong tone when you're only talking about yourself versus a good conversationalist would ask questions and create um, an environment that feels like a conversation because you're already you're focused on connecting versus focusing on telling and talking about how great your company is. So in in those particular in that particular instance, yeah, that's making sure let's get the business meeting into a conversation, and that's what we should be focusing on. A lot of the clients I work with the sales teams with the metric that we use is not presentations or pitches or meetings. I bucket it as it's conversations. How many, and by the way, that we know that it takes a certain number of conversations until you close a deal for certain clients. So having them understand that every one of those conversations is going to build and create the opportunity to do business, just as we talked about in the beginning, uh, that's important. That's how I track things. So I want people focused on that versus presenting. I love it. Little side note, one of the ways that I was able to improve my communication was door-to-door -door sales. And one yeah. of the best tips that I ever received about door-to-door -door sales was if it takes you, let's just say 25 doors to get a yes, every single door that's a no is contributing towards that yes. Right. You're not loss, 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 and eventually a win. You're just mini wins the entire time. And uh, so that's really cool that you're tracking conversations as a KPI instead of presentations or meetings exactly. or whatever. Yeah. Uh, think of it. I used to think of it as um, you want to get to know faster, so you can get open the door that has the yes. But it took all those no's to, to to get the yes you needed. I agree with you. Yeah, I love it. So next, we'll talk about what makes a conversation engaging. And in this part of the book, you have the seven C's of engagement. So let's talk a little bit about a couple of them to give my yeah. audience a preview of what they can learn. A couple so, of the ones that. Oh yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, no, you go. You go. You. you, you I was just going to go right from the top. So. Uh, content is number one. I think that's probably the most important one. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that for a minute. It seems so simple. And, and I, by the way, the, the, what was the joke that I wrote about? You know, there probably could have been like six or eight C's, but we had to make it seven. You had so to make it seven. seven, seven. Yeah. So at least you remember it. Uh, your people, why are you having the conversation in the first place is really at the meat of everything, right? What is the content that you're trying to cover? You're trying to introduce yourself. You're trying to introduce a new product. You're trying to solve a problem. At the meat of every single conversation is something you're talking about. What is the topic? And a lot of times, you know, we've had these situations, by the way, when we think we're having a conversation, but we're not because people are all over the map. They're, they're how was your day? Oh, I have to do this. I have to do this task. Like, oh, can you do that? And like, it's a jumpy type of thing. Whereas if it was focused on one particular piece of content at one time, it would be simple. It would be in a, a real sense of content and concretely in that content. And we would know what we're talking about. So yeah, it is. it seems so simple, but a lot of times we can get lost in knowing that that content is something that you can connect with another individual is an important piece too. Like, so I'm sure you're gonna bleed into this, but um, a content is only really good as the context it's within, which is the second C. So you need to contextualize the content within it and make sure that um, you can relate to the person you're you're speaking with and trying to connect with, with that content. And, and I don't like to have people think too much about it. I want them to just make sure that, look, all, you, you will not have all seven C's in every conversation you have, but you, cert, there are certain ones that need to be there and should be a focus of how you should have your conversations. 
Well, and what's useful for me as, as the way that I like to learn is I can look at these seven C's and you're right. Six C's is closer than <laughs> eight C's, but I think seven was the right number. So you look at these seven C's and you could say, where are my strong points? Where do I consistently show up and execute these C's in a decent way versus, oh, wow, you know what? My cadence really does need a lot of work. I should pay attention to this. People oftentimes look at me like, why are you sitting there not speaking or why are you speaking so fast or whatever the case is uh, or connection or whatever the, whatever the C is going to be. And so you get to audit yourself. And I think that's very useful as a reader to sort of grade yourself against the seven C's. Yeah. And, and getting back to the original one of content, the word I like to use is it's familiar content. It is. Uh, and, yeah. and that's a key thing is what is somebody else familiar with? Uh, there's a difference when you present something new to somebody when then you end up kind of not necessarily having as much of a conversation because you're almost teaching someone with it. But if you both know what you're talking about, um, what, what, what do you think the weather is like? Or um, what did you think of the presentation we just said? Or what did you think of the book that you and I are having? The familiar content right now is Speakeasy. And to our listeners, their familiar content is your program. So they're familiar that you're bringing on great authors that are going to talk about these books that they're going to connect with. So to them, that's their familiarity with it. And that's why they can connect with our conversation. Yeah, I love the familiar content piece. And I actually, I, I recently saw a social media post that said, it's okay to repost your best performing content because people are familiar with it. They want more yeah. of the same. They don't always want new and different. Right. And I thought about that a little bit. The example in the piece of content was, if you go to a concert, let's just say it's somebody like, Aerosmith. You don't want them to play all the new stuff that you haven't heard before. You want them to play their greatest hits because you're familiar with it. Yeah. And I think the same thing happens with creators like you and like me. We want to have conversations about familiar topics. You want the listener to be familiar with the style of show that you're going to have. And yeah. so you can't switch it up too much. It needs to be familiar. And I'm sure even the flow of this, if you look at the entire from intro to outro of your podcast, there are overlaps and things that we're all familiar with that we, we want to hear again, or there's a certain part of the show that you want to cover. That's a really, really important piece because that's what we connect with. Um, that's why we watch certain shows over and over again. Why, while I'll tell you, I turn the news off once I get to the sports because I knew that's like, that's my bedtime at that point. <laughs> it's going to come later in the news so they can throw all the other stuff at me. But that that familiarity with it um, we love to connect with it. It's it's like a warm blanket, something we're a little uh, familiar with and we know we can adapt to. Let's touch on one more before we yeah. before we move on uh, to practice and preparation. Let's talk a little bit about creativity. That's a subject that there aren't a lot of great books about creativity specifically. So sometimes I get questions about creativity. What do you do to encourage creativity? What do you do to become more creative? Because it is a learned skill. So how do we tap into it? How do we exercise it? The simplest way to think about creativity, and let's get to the root of it, it's something that you created, right? It's something that came from you, like an idea, your authentic self, whatever it is. By the way, um, I am by no means artistic. My fine motor skills are terrible, but I will tell you, uh, if, if I threw some paint up on a wall, it would, you know, it would certainly be creative. I don't know if it would be appreciated by anybody, but it would be something that came from me. I think that's at, at the epicenter of when it comes to creativity is that it doesn't need to be something completely new. It just got to be something from you. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's one of the key messages that I have. Just injecting that component of it could be creative. By the way, you could also inject a little of your own humor or your own personality into the mix. That's creative onto itself. It doesn't have to be a brand new idea every single time you have a conversation or you know an aha moment. Uh, it just has to be your moment. And, that, and that's an important part about conversations that that's creative enough is that you've come up with something that is from you and we value that. And by the way, we do appreciate it because we like coming up with creative stuff too and we learn something about the other individual. So yeah, creativity, a key C in the seven Cs. You know, an interesting reflection I just had very quickly was that I was sort of debating it as, uh, for a second, the familiar content, does that contradict creativity? But it really doesn't because- your creativity comes from your unique self, like you're saying, and that creates the familiarity over time with your audience. You are the differentiator. So I think that's yeah. really cool. I would, I'll use some of my old friends, uh, friends that I've had for a very long time, known for over 40 some odd years, and we grew up together at certain stages of our lives. 
there's probably going to be a movie quote from like, you know, the 70s, 80s or 90s, like thrown into the conversation just randomly because that's what we used to do. And by the way, that might be pretty creative, but that's also <laughs> something that we know about. And it's something that we certainly have done over and over again. No different than that post you talked about that was creative at that particular time. Just bringing that back up uh, enables us to look at something that we can all connect with. It does. Yeah. yeah. And you have a, a line in chapter five, set the stage where you talk. Well, actually, it's the intro line, the Howard Stern line. It says, quote, anything you find yourself holding back, it's probably what the audience most wants to hear. Uh, and yeah. sometimes for me, I think when I was first starting this journey, I was holding certain things back. And I think once I let myself bleed into the content a little bit more, then people could become more familiar with me because they understood me more. So when you're writing and you're speaking, do you ever just let things go. I mean, it sounds like oh. you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm an, I'm an extrovert by nature and, and, and I'm one, I just had a conversation with a fellow extrovert, a great author who wrote the book Swagger, Leslie M. And Leslie talks about that. She too, when she meets people and she can, has a con, like she gets excited and she gets to talk about her swagger stuff. She's excited when she goes out afterwards, she just wants to do more of it. That's exactly how I am. So um, no, I don't hold anything back and it probably is problematic at times. I'll just keep going with, with, with what I want to talk about or, or lift that energy up. And I, and I will go there. I'll ask the, un, the tough question. I'll ask the uncomfortable question. And I'll usually do it early on. Uh, pointing out Howard in the book, Howard was instrumental in a lot of ways because whether or not you agreed with some of the stuff that he did, which was a little bit childish and fun, it was attention getting in his earlier years. He's by far one of the best interviewers I've ever heard. And go listen to him today. He's way more mature than that in his now, you know, his 60s. Uh, he's incredible because he asks the questions that we're all thinking about and he doesn't hold back and he just lets it let that go. I think in the world we're in, we're a little bit worried about what to say today. We're a little afraid to say certain things because there is a sensitivity, uh, political correctness, uh, from all the issues, politics, race, uh, gender equalities, gender levels, things to say, even the right pronouns to use in the right sentences. Um, there's a lot of changes going on. And, and what that's doing in many instances is it's limiting people from having that conversation. While it is challenging and it, what it is doing is it's challenging us to have better conversations and more clear ones. It should not be limiting us from not having them at all. We should be going out there and having more conversations uh, because that is where the connection is made. And in fact, we might learn something even better around each of those issues. One of the biggest challenges that you know the United States has had is that there's been some advantage by only talking about one side or only talking about one direction. And, and it seems to have worked in a certain way. Well, it might be working for politicians or for getting elected or doing certain things or dividing our country. It's certainly not going to bring it together and recognize that those two sides need to start having conversation as all sides do. And we all know that every conflict is resolved with a conversation because that's where the connection is made. So instead of only dealing with the familiar content, I'll say this, we should be open to having those other conversations and you know, do the things, don't be afraid to hold back and be able to be open in those instances. So don't hold back, let yourself out and express, express the things you're thinking about and learn from it too. And I think that's important. If you ask it in a question way, or if you start that conversation, not with judgment or telling someone or putting a belief, be open. And by doing that, you know, go go listen how Howard asked questions on any of his interviews, uh, wh whether the topic was appropriate or not. He asked it in an open way that made you think and really engage the person that was in there that that they opened up as well. And that's the important part. It isn't just one person um, who's letting go and opening up. It's enabling another to want to appreciate that moment in the conversation that they will too. I love that point. We're going to definitely turn that into an Instagram reel or something like that, because that's <laughs> a home run point. I mean, something that I'm observing with you right now is that after 1500 or 800 podcast interviews, you've consumed different perspectives, different yeah. political perspectives, different perspectives on social issues, different perspectives on business and communication or whatever the subject is. And uh, I've done that over the last few years by reading hundreds of different perspectives on similar topics and books. And what that does is it does, it makes you more tolerant. It makes you less judgmental. Yeah. It allows you to take in a piece of information without becoming emotionally reactive to it. 
and it gives you more time to process it and respect it. And I think that's really important. So you're highlighting something that I think somebody like a Joe Rogan is doing really well right now, which is sitting right in the middle and allowing people to say what they want to say. Sometimes with his responses, he makes mistakes. He goes out there and he learns from them. And that's all you can do when you're having a conversation Mm -hmm. is you have to resolve it, like you said, which is really cool. There's only one way anything gets resolved in any of these matters of, you know, difficulty and sensitivity and it's through these conversations so it's it's a big it's a big factor in the way that we can be better communicators and connectors and that's what i like people to think and maybe more importantly using that sense of appreciation remember appreciate that you are going to have that conversation that it's a gift that you're going to get that other perspective and and some of the perspectives if you open yourself up to appreciate what someone else is going to say in a conversation what you can learn you're going to grow you're, you're going to grow and you're now going to have a more valued opinion. And you might actually be able, you know, I don't know if it might change your opinion. It might, you know, you may never agree with another person. Make it clear. Not every conversation is going to be, oh, we all are happy and, and, and come together. Trust me, there's going to be disagreements. But at least you'll get to respect one another's opinion and have that view that you agree to disagree. And you can know where people stand because that's some of the the challenges that we have. And that will really help you make that connection with that person and know where the line can be drawn and where you can be brought together. Yeah, 1000%. Now, one of the one of the things that I'm personally curious about is how do you stay so present during conversations? You mentioned earlier, you developed this skill set of being able to listen. And uh, I know when I was first starting the Book Thinkers podcast that I had a very difficult time not looking at my questions and responding to the person who just said something really cool and asking a proper follow-up question. Like it's tough to be present. Sometimes you're always thinking about what you want to ask next. But spectacular question, uh, Nick. Uh, And I've, and I've tried to figure it out myself. Uh, So part of it is that I have a genuine appreciation. You you heard me talk about um, in the book, I mentioned the connect, connect your voice, V O I C E. Uh, That is an exercise that I live and breathe by. And that, um, and that's to visualize how the conversation will go, appreciate the opportunity, know the identity I need to be when I'm having the conversation, and the two parts, which are going to get to your point here, add your charisma and energy into every single conversation. And that energy is required when I need to be a listener and when I need to be there. I have to have that energy there to stay focused. Uh, but I also know that there's an advantage. It's, it's a real sense of appreciation. It's a real simple thing. If you were talking to someone else and they weren't paying attention to you, how would you feel? And that's all I need. All I need is the sense of, I want to be appreciated when I have something to say. So I'm going to listen and and keep the focus and make, and by the way, they're a guest on my program. And these, that's the same way I am with a client in a business meeting and with a random stranger I'll talk with. If you sense that you're appreciative of having that conversation and go in with that attitude, And now recognize, hey, that person's also going to appreciate me just by me being appreciative of them. That is true. And we need to do more of that in this world. And that's what I was hoping. If there's ever one lesson that I want people to do is appreciate how valuable conversations are. So that's my big part. So the energy is important. That will keep you focused with that sense of appreciation of what a gift it is in that moment in time. It is incredibly important. I I just finished a couple of months ago, a book called Cues by Vanessa Van Edwards. And she talks about the art of charisma in that book. She, she says charisma is the balance between competence and warmth, and that it is reciprocal. When you give charisma, you will receive charisma. And I think that's cool that you just said for you, charisma really equals focus yeah. and attention. And so When you're charismatic, you're going to get charisma back and that draws you back into the conversation and it keeps you there and it keeps the other person there. And I think that's really cool. It's a really cool way that you put that. Cool. Yeah. Glad you like. Uh, The voice acronym was something that I was going to talk a little bit about. So I'm happy that you touched base on that. We only have about 10 minutes left. So before we wrap up the show, I I do have a, a pretty cool question here. We talked on your show about movies and you shared your favorite movie with me. And I'd love for you to share that with the Book Thinkers family because it was a really cool point that you're making. So uh, I, Nicholas is right. I ask just about every guest on the show what their favorite movie is. And my favorite movie is Rocky. And, and I could even encompass it as the entire series. I think Rocky Balboa is just, uh, Sylvester Stallone would probably agree, is the greatest fictional character ever created. And uh, 
it, it has a lot to do with um, his spirit. And his spirit is actually one of the, the, the way I sign off every show is I go, keep moving onward and upward before I say, be brief, be bright, be gone. But keep moving onward and upward. That is what Rocky is all about. Um, he uses that line that says, you know, life is really hard. Um, and it's not about how hard you get it, get hit. You, it's getting hit and getting up and keep moving forward. That is life. That is what winning is about. And I look at, when I say connect, engage, and win often in the book, win, it, win isn't just winning or closing the deal. Winning is what we're trying to achieve in life. Winning is a feeling that we have of appreciating our lives and appreciating every hard effort we have. And Rocky, I mean, my goodness, what, you know, from, from rags to riches, but also just the effort. In the first movie, he doesn't win the fight. He just gets to the end and it's the journey. And I think all of us uh, really do appreciate what a hard fought journey that life is. And I, it's to me, it's the best, uh, it's the most emblematic and representative uh, movie I've ever seen. And it always inspires me. And the music's pretty damn good too. The music is good too. It's a good, it's good workout music. So oh, yeah. how many times do you think you've seen the first Rocky movie? Oh, uh, and I wouldn't be I wouldn't be undercutting it and saying it's in it's probably forty to fifty maybe even more maybe I've been it. like I'm I'm a little older than you Nicholas so I've had I've had it's been around you know uh, since I was six years old so yeah it's been I've been watching a lot of times and have you been to Philly and climbed the steps and seen the statue and Mo more than once let's just say <laughs> I, I I don't think I got to do it with my kids I know that because we never really went to Philly like together and did that trip but I've done it several times yeah so. It's pretty cool that the entire city's mascot is a fictional character. It's it's pretty awesome. And yeah, that uh, just shows it, how cool the movie is. And and the whole series is great. I, for those who haven't seen, except for Rocky Five, which didn't exist in my book. That was a terrible one, but that's not important right now. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm happy you brought it up. Did we cover everything? Is there anything else that you'd like to highlight for the Book Thinkers family about Speakeasy? Remember, it comes out on the 27th, so everybody needs to pre-order it if they resonated with today's conversation. Is there anything that we didn't cover? Look, we, we covered it. I'll just go with um, the way I sign off every show, and that'll help you with this show, is to be brief, be brief, be gone. I call it B5G, which is how many Bs there are in that expression. Uh, when you think about your conversations, it's a good way to summarize it. Be brief and recognize that time is, is limited and appreciate everybody's time when you're in it. So make sure that what you're saying is bright. Um, try to lift up the conversations that you have and, and, and add an energy or a pulse to it and, and some good ideas and good conversation talk. And be gone doesn't mean, you know, drop the mic and walk away. Be gone means move onward and upward, as we were just talking about with Rocky. Uh, that's what we want our conversations to do, because our goal is to have more conversations. So I hope Speak Easy will enable you to do that. That's just the last tip I would get from one of the chapters in there. I think that's a great way to sign off. Before we do, for those that want to learn a little bit more about you, your upcoming book release, your podcast, et cetera, where should they go? What should they do? To grab yourself a copy of Speakeasy, go to speakeasybook.com. And that will take you to thriveloud.com, where the Speakeasy book is. And that's where you can pre-order the book. You can hear all the podcasts. You can actually hear Nicholas's episode as well, which is on the program. And you could also learn about all the things I do in helping uh, companies to connect, engage, and win in their business. Uh, Lou, you are amazing at what you do. I'm happy you wrote this book. I think it's going to help a lot of people. And uh, thank you for coming on the Book Thinkers Life Changing Books podcast. Dude, thank you so much for having me on. And thank uh, your whole community for uh, checking this out.